Hi, my name is Dr Catherine Hughes from Crime Psych. I'm a criminal psychologist and I run a business that enables me to bring knowledge and learning to everyone, not just those who are at universities or colleges. And I do this by producing a range of blogs, vlogs and free online courses. But I do also run some slightly more in-depth courses, both online and face-to-face. -face. You don't need any previous qualifications to learn with me and there are several subjects available. So once you've finished watching this video, why not head on over to my website and see if you can make it to an event or learn online in your own time. In all of my videos, I try to focus on the psychology of the behaviour. However, it is sometimes necessary to include some details. This video contains some details of rape, torture, bondage and murder. This particular video is a psychological analysis of Dennis Rader, who's also known as the BTK killer. He murdered 10 people between 1974 and 1991. He wasn't caught until 2005. With some of the psychological analysis videos that I've done, there's a huge amount of information available and this case is no different. There have been some pieces of information that I have missed in some of the cases, but I don't believe that any of these change any of the psychological factors that drive the offender's behaviour. With Dennis Rader, the first thing that I noticed was this was a man who wanted to be seen and noticed. This isn't necessarily a rare thing. Sometimes the worst thing that you could do to a serial killer is not know who they are. Dennis Rader had already been given a diagnosis of narcissistic, antisocial and obsessive compulsive personality disorders. The psychologist reported that Rader has a grandiose sense of self a belief that he's special and therefore entitled to some special treatment. He has a pathological need for attention and admiration, a preoccupation with maintaining rigid order and structure, and a complete lack of empathy for his victims. Let's begin where I normally do, by looking at his childhood. He's the eldest of four children. Those who knew him said he was quiet, but always there, joining in. He wasn't into sports and he preferred hunting and fishing types of activity. People have said that he was a pretty unremarkable child and wasn't a neglected child. But Dennis Rader said that his parents, who both worked, were distanced and not interested in the children very much. He said that he harbours resentment towards them. On this first point, I just want to point out something that people often don't acknowledge. It doesn't matter what other people see or what other people think that their children are experiencing. It matters what the person saying it thinks and believes. His parents may not have been abusive and they provided well for their family. But if Dennis Rader felt a sense of abandonment and resented it, it's true for him. And it's a starting point for forming negative relationships and associations. As I said, his parents both worked long hours and paid little attention to the children at home. Rader later described feeling ignored by his mother in particular and resented her for it. His childhood seems fairly unremarkable. However, a district attorney in a documentary about him said that Rader had recalled that his grandmother killed chickens and he was thrilled by that. A friend said he participated in activities like hunting and fishing etc and that he was fairly quiet. Friends have said that he would hang turtles and kill stray animals. His schooling also seemed unremarkable and he's remembered for just being quiet. The same documentary that I've just mentioned also says that Rader was reprimanded by a teacher who hum humiliated him in front of the class. He went around to her house after and watched her, presumably to do something as revenge for the humiliation. He tied a rope around his waist and had an orgasm, age 11 or 12, whilst watching her through the window. Rope and voyeurism was then associated with pleasure. By his mid-teens, he was undergoing changes that set him apart from the other boys. He was having sexual fantasies. By that time, he said that he knew what his future was going to be. He knew what he wanted to be. He says that he tortured and killed animals as well as peeping up women through windows and stealing underwear. Yet he came across as somewhat normal to those who knew him. Rader served in the United States Air Force and went back to college and he earned a bachelor's degree in the administration of justice. 
Raider worked in several jobs and he went on to marry and they had two children. He was a Cub Scout leader and the president of the church council. On the surface of things, he was living a normal suburban life and was respected within his community. Nobody, including his wife and children, suspected that he was even capable of killing. I think that's why this is such a popular case. He lived a secret life of voyeurism, bondage, rape, torture and murder. We all like to think that we could spot a serial killer or at the very least spot the signs that something isn't quite right with someone. But Dennis Rader didn't show any signs that indicated how evil he was. However, this is much more prevalent than you might initially think. We all have different roles that we play out under different circumstances. You wouldn't look at a manager in an office and immediately see a tennis player or a golfer, do you? You see them as a competent authority figure. Watching this video now, you don't think of me as a motorcyclist, do you? But I am. You wouldn't look at a family man and see a rapist, but he might be. Commentary on this case always mentions his incredible ability to compartmentalise his life. We all do that to some degree though. When I'm researching a case, I don't think of myself as a mother or a caregiver at that time because I'm not doing activities that relate to those things at the time. Granted, in Dennis Rader's case, his activities were extreme. But when he was raping or killing women, he wasn't a father or a husband at those particular times. He was acting in ways that he found sexually pleasurable. He was a narcissistic psychopath and therefore didn't see other people as having any rights. He thought of his own needs first. He would have married and had children because it gave him the front that he needed to carry out such atrocious acts. Psychopaths do have this remarkable ability to act in ways that are seen as normal. It allows them to become hidden in plain sight. He'd known from a young age that he was sexually deviant and he learned to cover that well. When he knows that he's caught, he has no problem recalling all of the murders. He tells the court details of each one with absolutely no emotion whatsoever. This is because he didn't acknowledge the victims at all. They were simply objects for him to carry out acts on that he found pleasurable. He prided himself in knowing where other serial killers had gone wrong. When he murdered the Otero family, he'd entered the house knowing that he'd encounter Mrs Otero and the children, but he wasn't expecting Mr Otero. He said that he didn't have a mask on when he entered the house. He said that they'd, they'd already seen his face, so he just had to put them down, strangle them. This is typical of a psychopath not having any ability to recognise emotion at all. Straight after one murder, he went home to his wife. He was sat at breakfast reading the newspaper about the killings and she said, oh look, he misspells the word the same way as you do. And then he said that he thought to himself, I thought I was going to have to kill her right there and then, but she let it go. He wasn't ever capable of love. No narcissist or psychopath ever is. Any love that he showed towards them was simply an act. When the media reported that three men were under suspicion for the murders, he sent the first letter of communication saying that more people will die. He was livid that somebody else was about to get credit for his work. He even telephoned the police to report the next murder. He was proud of his work. In his mind, he was finally being seen. He'd even suggested that he should be called the BTK, as this was his signature way of killing, bind, torture, kill. He was a sadist and he got pleasure from seeing the victims suffer. He wouldn't have wanted them to die quickly. In court, he said, if you know anything about serial killers, you'll know that they go through different phases. They go through the trolling stage where they look for their victims. You can be trolling people for years, but once you lock onto somebody, it becomes stalking. He wanted people to know that he'd done his research and showed how well he planned for each offence. 
he took a great deal of pride throughout the whole process. The next kill he planned very well and he already had an alibi ready. He took his son out on a boy scout night out and got up at one in the morning, went and killed, then he returned to camp. He took that woman that he'd killed to the church when she was already dead and posed her in different form of bondage and took pictures. He then dumped her body on the roadside on his way back to camp. He stopped killing though without ever being caught or ever being under suspicion. After 25 years, a newspaper ran a story on the murders. After reading it, he sent the police another letter. He started a cat and mouse game of posing cereal boxes with dolls inside in the area. He was playing games with the police. He placed items around the area and he told the media where to look for them. In one of the letters to the police, Raider shared disturbing details from his childhood that explained the motivations behind his brutal sexually charged murders. Raider explained that as a boy, he would often view pornography which he believed led him to develop violent fantasies as a, as a teenager that involved sadomasochism, bondage and domination. By 18, Raider said his fantasies escalated into window peeping and stealing women's underwear. These progressions that we see over and over with serial killers is a crucial step that moves them closer to killing someone. A person doesn't just wake up one day and decide that they're going to kill. They start with smaller deviant acts first, such as watching pornography, peeping through windows. Then they move on to physical contact with a victim, such as entering properties without permission or even rape. Each barrier that's overcome leads them onto the next behaviour and the next and so on. During the period that he didn't kill, he turned his attention inwards to autoerotic activities. He'd dress himself up in women's clothing and in various forms of bondage posing and he took pictures of himself. During this, he would have drawn on his memories of killing to add to this pleasure. Therefore, it's unsurprising that he was able to recall each murder in such detail years later. He would have recalled the memory of them hundreds of times. Serial killers will often take small items as trophies so that they can be used to help them relive their experience. During the game of cat and mouse sending the letters to the police and the media, Raider asked if his writings, if they were put onto a floppy disk, could be traced or not. The police answered his question in a newspaper as they were instructed to, saying that it'd be safe to use the disk and they wouldn't be able to identify him. And it was the metadata on that disc that led to his identification. Tennis Raider was so arrogant and had such feelings of grandiose that he fully expected the police to be honest with him. DNA had been obtained from one of his victims and the police had matched this DNA to his daughter and they identified a family match. He was found guilty of 10 murders and at his court hearing, he gave a rambling 30 minute long speech that has been likened to an awards acceptance speech. His statement has been described as an example of just how psychopaths cannot understand the emotional content of language. He was sentenced to 10 consecutive life sentences with a minimum term of 175 years. I hope that you found this psychological analysis interesting, but more importantly, I hope that you've learned something from it. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.